Train the muscles, not the joints. Welcome back to Natural Goland Bodybuilding. Mountain. I'm saying mountain for you guys that are new here and you don't know what I'm saying. I'm saying mountain, okay? In a wise man voice, you know, like some sort of aboriginal wise man. It started off as a joke and then it just became a way that we greet each other on this channel. That's about it. So uh, yeah, if you're wondering what that is, that's what's going on. So today I did some legs. I already did some squats and then I did some uh, goblets, goblet squats. I think they're called goblet squats. We hold the dumbbell in front of you, right? Uh, I like to call them goblin squats, but goblet squats, what they're called. But a lot of times uh, the squat is like one of the most fanatical kind of like crazy sort of movements that I've <laughs> ever encountered. Uh, but it's a, it's a beautiful movement. But for me, I just have been blessed with uh, strange proportions. And my twin brother has the same thing. When he used to squat, same issue, right? So if I want to go down really low, I have to go really wide. And that's not really hitting my muscles and my legs the way I want because I start to hit more like, uh, I, I guess, more the adductors and I start to use the muscles around the hips and stuff to get out of the hole. Uh, but even so, I found that the partial squat, as defined by people out there, they say, oh, you're just doing partial squats. That is the best thing for me to do because of where the bar sits on my back and how I naturally, like my, my torque curve is naturally in this area, right? The power band. Those of you guys that ride dirt bikes and motorcycles, that's really where my power band is, right? And once I come down, like down to doing this, it, it's like I lose my power band. And at the same time, I find it most importantly, extremely hard on the knees. And also you get the butt wink sort of thing. And, and it doesn't matter how much flexibility training I do, it, it really has to do with the way my joints are built and the length of the lever arms. So, uh, you know, there's always somebody in the comments that wants to give me some advice. <laughs> But the thing is, I've been doing this shit for 35 years. Like I know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And trust me, I've tried every other type of, of, of method possible on the squat and always landed back on this. Uh, you know, and the funny thing is the only time I ever started getting irritated knees was when I started doing lower depth with my squats, even with lighter weights, you know, so, uh, you know, so there's some people out there that think that you can do a certain range of motion. And as long as you're doing lighter weights, it doesn't really matter. And I find that that's right some of the time, but not all of the time. Sometimes there'll be certain movements that you do. And, as, and if there's tension there, it will start to irritate the area if you do it over and over again, right? So um, yes, this boils down to your injury history. Yes, this will boil down to your individual genetics, all of that. But in the end, listening to the body is the most important thing. And if your body's telling you, hey, you got bad joint pain every time you do the exercise this way, then the best advice I can give you is don't do the exercise that way. Try a different way and see if that works better for you, right? So for me with the squat, I find the same type of depth I would use for jumping is the best depth for me for squat. That keeps the most tension on my quads, my ass and my hamstrings. Uh, I'm able to keep the lower back in the right form. I'm able to use weights, which are a challenge to my overall system. So I get that systemic stress as well. Uh, but when I just stay with lighter weights and, and even if I go deeper with lighter weights, it still causes the same irritation on my knees, right? So this is not a weight thing. It's not like I'm ego lifting, uh, to, you know, I'm not adjusting my technique to do four plates. I find even if I'm doing two plates or three plates, the technique is, is pretty much the same. So now that said, when I finished off with goblet squats, you can see that my form totally changes. Well, the reason why is because the weight the center of gravity is in a different area because I'm holding the weight in front of me instead of on my back. And of course, the amount of weight also plays a factor in where the center of gravity is going to play out. So this is why uh, the squat is such a, uh, let's just call it a freedom movement because each person's built a certain way and they're going to find their perfect way to do that squat. And it's not going to look like Tom Platts or Fred Hatfield or, or these different types of squat masters, right? Your squat might deviate a bit and that's okay. And I knew a guy that ran track back in the day and the guy was built like a gazelle. Like he was, he was a perfectly built guy for running 200, 400, 800 meters in track, right? Uh, he had these long femurs and super short lower back. It was like he was built just for running, like those legs, that long stride. But when he would squat, he would always beat himself up because it goes, oh man, every time I squat, it's like, I'm just coming down like this. And it's just, I have to bend over so much 
and no matter how much flexibility he did, he was a track coach. This guy stretched like crazy. Like it's, it's not like flexibility was his issue, uh, but he had to bend over so much because of the way he's built to maintain that center of gravity that the squat started to look kind of stupid for him. You know, like he's like, ah, oh, geez, I don't look like Tom Platts. Must be something wrong with me, right? But this guy uh, was really squatting the right way for him. That's just the way he had to do it. So a lot of times he had to supplement with different types of leg movements as well to offset uh, his genetic limitations and genetic strengths. But that's, that's really just the point. The squat will highlight certain things and, and that's just the way it is. Now, there is a difference between ego lifting and cheating as opposed to uh, doing the correct form for yourself. And I'll let you figure that out for yourself. But at the same time, uh, this is why I squat this way. I get the most amount of tension on the quads. Now, funny thing is, a lot of times people will say, oh, the lower you go, the more tension you're going to get on certain muscles. Well, I'm bending over so much, I'm getting a massive amount of tension on my ass and hamstrings. I'll tell you that right now. But funny enough, as I bend over and squat, I find because of the weight, I'm getting a massive amount of tension on the quads. More so than when I'm using way more range of motion in a goblet squat, right? So range of motion doesn't always equate to extra tension depending on how the forces are playing out and depending on how the dynamics of the lever arms are playing out okay so that's just something for you to know and yeah those of you who are doubting if i can build legs this way this is how i won national titles got my pro card this is the way i squatted i had to squat this way and this was the way that worked the best for me and i had some of the biggest legs on the natural bodybuilding stage so I, I've said this before, but I have to say it because there's a lot of new people here that always want to give me advice, but uh, that's it. So today I'm going to do some shoulder presses and uh, talk to you a little bit in between sets here. And then from there, I'm going to do a little bit of triceps and, and, and yeah, yeah, just finish off the workout here. So I already did four sets of four plates per side for squats. I did a couple sets of three plates, a set of two plates, a set of one plate. That's how I warm up, right? But then I went into the four sets of four plates for squats. So uh, but yeah, now I'm going to do some shoulder press. Now, here's a, another thing. The width that you use on the shoulder press will dictate how stupid or great your movement looks, right? I'm not saying it is stupid. I'm just saying if you use a wider grip, your, your movement's going to seem much smaller as opposed to when you're using a narrower because you get a lot of that elbow bend and, and straightening. So it makes it look like you're doing a much bigger movement, even though a similar amount of range of motion around the shoulder may be happening. So, that, so again, this is why you, you really want to be careful when it comes down to assessing what you're doing based on what somebody on the internet is saying. Because like I said with the squat, a lot of times people will say, hey, uh, you're only bending so much of the knee, you're doing it all wrong. But they're not even looking at the amount of bend that I have in the hips, right? How much I'm bending over and how much stretches in the hamstring. So, you know, sometimes just looking at how far the bar is going is not necessarily going to give you the best indicator of exactly what's happening and how the forces are playing out. Although it, he can give you a hint, but it's not, not the whole picture, right? So uh, here on Natural Goland Bodybuilding, you guys are whole picture guys, so that's why I'm explaining this stuff to you. But yeah, let's go, uh, I'm going to go medium, medium grip here. I don't, I don't lock out at the top like this. I find as soon as I'm doing this, this creates more of an instability in the shoulder. It's harder on the neck, and I don't get any more delt tension. If anything, it takes some of the tension off my delts and transfers it into the stabilization of the shoulders and the neck and the rotator cuff and all that comes into it. And uh, yeah, you could do that if you want, but remember the bar goes up and then here, but from here to here, I find that I'm getting more uh, neck issues instead of actually dealt. It's almost like this last little bit, I'm, I'm just raising the shoulders in order to get that. So it's not necessarily giving me more dealt stretch and more dealt tension. And that's what I'm doing this movement for. <clears throat> so here we go, let's do easy few reps here. Now, what I've said a thousand times, I'll say it again. <laughs> That's the YouTube, right? It's the art of repeating yourself, I guess, in different ways. Uh, but I, I keep on getting comments still to this day of, you know, only full range of motion and only slow reps or only heavy weight or only progressive overloader. And, and, I, and again, these people are missing out on a major, major, major thing that is important to understand when it comes down to natural bodybuilding. Natural bodybuilding isn't just one technique. It's a number of techniques that combine 
in order to create synergy. So case in point, so case in point, sometimes if I do super high frequency training with super lightweights, right? Uh, the body bliss program is a good example of this. If I do that all the time exclusively, it won't be enough for me to get the best gains. It is a good part of the picture, but like I've said, I have to eventually go to heavyweight some days or even have extra rest and do some heavier weight to hit different fibers. And then maybe it's a two day split or a three day split and then come back to the body bliss type of stuff and then go back into two day split or whatever. And I go back and forth. Now, if you've been doing a two day split or you've been doing three day split, and you've been doing heavy for a long time. The body bliss program is great because you know, you do that for three weeks, four weeks. It helps you deload or uh, de-stress the system. And then when you come back, you're ready and raring to go to lift that heavy weight. But it by no means means that this is an exclusive system and that's all you do. Uh, unless of course you're getting great results with it, then you know, stick with it as long as you want. But for myself, I've always found that good technique and slow reps, they serve a certain purpose. I do hit those slow twitch fibers, but if I'm not doing the heavy weight, more fast twitch fiber type power oriented stuff, I'm definitely missing out on a massive amount of gains. So by being sore or being tight from doing that heavy movements, then when I go do the lighter movements, I get an extra large pump and I find that I can push those slower twitch fibers into a deeper level of failure because more strength and more power does equate to more endurance or more strength endurance at least anyway. So if I am combining the two so that we are hitting both the fibers, you're hitting the nervous system and you're hitting different energy pathways is great. Now, the other weak link about doing reps, reps, reps all the time is that you're always working those energy pathways, but you're not necessarily working the tissue pathways as aggressively as with heavy weight. So you want to go back and forth. You know what I'm saying? So the low weight, high rep type stuff helps pump blood into the tissues to help them recover and heal. But then you're also stimulating those tissues by doing the heavy weight and by combining all this, it, it works great, right? So that's, that's something that, uh, that I see is still being missed. It's still being misunderstood. It's still, uh, you know, and of course it's usually the beginners or the intermediates that are making these statements. They're so afraid and so insecure that they're so afraid that they might be doing the wrong thing. So the first thing they do is they just, they become one of those guys that goes door to door to share their religion, right? They're like so afraid that they're wrong. They think, Hey, if I can convince everybody else that my religion is right, then somehow it means that I'll be saved, right? It's the same thing in bodybuilding. It's the same shit all over again, right? So nervous about being wrong. And so they, they try to convince the world and therefore it helps affirm that their pathways is, is that they've taken is okay. You know, um, but I'm going to say any pathway you take is okay as long as you are paying attention along the way and you don't get fanatical about your path because the path is ever evolving. Mountain. See, that was very wise. Don't you, don't you think that was a very wise thing to say? I think it was very wise. I'm going to put some more weight on here. All right, more weight. I put on some heavier weight uh, on, the, on the shoulder press there. And of course, then the microphone cut out on me, the battery died. So uh, and I had to change the batteries. And of course, like typical YouTube problems, right? You, you film for about 20 minutes, then you find out that the batteries are dead and that nothing you talked about was even recorded. So there you go. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, we'll see if I can salvage something here. But one thing I did talk about was uh, seated shoulder press as opposed to standing shoulder press. And basically a lot of people have that debate of free weight versus machine. And uh, I was one of those guys too. I'd be like, oh, free weights are always the best. It's the best way to stimulate the whole system and all that. And, and I'm saying to a large part, I, I still agree with that, but uh, there is a point to where that thinking can hold you back. And one of those points is that say you're doing free weights and you're doing a lot of uh, the compound lifts and, and the big, you know, main foundational lifts and stuff. 
and you're noticing that your physique is developing a certain way, but there's, there's certain weak links that are developing, like say certain muscles that are not popping or not uh, really being stimulated, or you're not able to establish that mind-muscle connection there. Uh, sometimes when you use a machine, you can get more stimulation. The reason why is because you're not using all this energy on the stability. Uh, because a lot of times, whatever it is that gives out first, whatever hits failure first is going to be the thing that you, uh, you acc acclimate to or that you adapt to, right? So that's why long distance runners don't, don't have big quads. You know what I'm saying? Like their cardio system is the weak link. That's what they, you know, they have more than enough strength in the legs. It's the cardio that they have problem with. So it's, it's a matter of what is it that is hitting failure. And a lot of times when you're doing certain movements where you have to stabilize, there are certain main muscle groups that may be hitting failure first, but not necessarily the ones that you want. Uh, because maybe uh, the stabilizers and the other muscle groups are given out first. And sometimes the machines can change that dynamic where your main muscle group that you want to hit is giving out first before the other muscle groups and therefore it becomes the weak link in the exercise and therefore has to adapt. So a lot of times people underestimate this, but this is why you see a lot of major bodybuilders use machines for certain muscle groups because they find that they are very certain about what muscle is hitting failure. And some of those hard to get areas are uh, sometimes hard uh, to get when it comes down to using free weights because the free weights bring in, they tend to bring in more muscle groups than, than say the ones that you want to just hit or isolate themselves. So it's definitely easier to isolate a muscle group with a machine in some cases. And, and because of that, uh, you, you tend to get better development, at least in certain areas, not, not every area. And that's why there is an advantage to training in a gym is that you can experiment with these different types of pieces of equipment uh, and, and go from there. And, and again, it's going to be based on the person, right? And, you know, I've, I've had so many times where I worked out with certain workout partners and they're like, oh, this machine's the best. I love it. I love it. And then I get on it and it's like, oh, this is horrible. It doesn't work for me. I, you know, our dimensions are different, right? So it, the forces are playing out differently. And that's the nice advantage of free weights is that you can cater the arc of the movement and everything based on what feels comfortable and right for you. Uh, but again, don't let that type of thinking limit you because there are going to be certain machines which might be the best possible thing for you to isolate a certain area. I'm going to go for some steeper incline triceps here. A little bit of a steeper incline. I mess around the incline. Sometimes lower, sometimes higher. So I had a few of you uh, in the comments lately talk about how uh, you've uh, followed your own way or at least tried to figure out what works for you. Even if you haven't found out, I mean, it's, it's, it's an ever-changing sort of goalpost. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you're going to find that, uh, you know, one technique works and then it doesn't anymore and, or your body's evolved out of that other technique and now it's, it's a different type of workout program you feel you need or you get results from. It's, it's a continual process. So don't ever think or make the mistake of thinking you're done. Or, or don't get frustrated and say, ah, oh, shit, I'll never figure it out because there's somehow some holy grail. It's like, no, it's, it's a moving goalpost. As you age or as you uh, go through different types of challenges with your training, uh, your, your body sometimes will just need different things. That's just the way it is, right? So, uh, but, but one thing I, I've heard people say in the comments is that they've found at least some things that are working for them and it only came through listening to themselves and, and droning out all of the noise of, of the critics, right? And that's really what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm really trying to help you uh, say, listen, just, just, just find out how to get into your own sound chamber. You know, don't listen to the trolls on the internet. <laughs> uh, unless, of course, they have something positive to say or something that may be helpful. But, but don't take it too seriously if your body is telling you otherwise. That's all I'm saying. You know, if your body's telling you that, hey, I, you know, doing this certain movement a certain way, just killing me. Like your, your joints are just done fire or they're dying from it then yeah, there's a good chance that maybe that's just not the right thing for you, at least right now. Maybe in the future it is, but right now it's not the right thing. Uh, maybe something else needs to happen, maybe some type of stretching 
or a reassessment of your technique or maybe some sort of healing of some sort of injury, whatever it might be, uh, maybe that technique's not right for you. And, and maybe it never will be. That's the other thing. That's the other possibility you got to go, get into. So uh, good for you for following your own shit, you know, good for you for following yourself, trying to find a way. Uh, that's, that's what we need in the world is people to have independent thought, you know, people that can think for themselves. I, I admire that. And, and regardless of whether you're right about your experiment or not right now, uh, I, I firmly believe that you're better off being this way and making a few mistakes than you are just following blindly the next trend that all the sheep in the world are trying to tell you that you've got to follow, you know? So uh, you never become the best that way. Eh? Yeah. What's he thinking? Eh? I think I'm going to be a children's uh, puppeteer. I just, you know, talk to the bicep. Hey there, bicep. How are you today? Eh? And then the kids will really like that. Used to be a show on TV called The Friendly Giant. Do you remember that one? It was on when I was a kid, so it's a really old show. Be like, hey, Rusty. And then there was like this puppet, I think it was a bird or something that would talk to him. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I could, I could start a children's show like that and just uh, my bicep would be the puppet, you know? Yeah, there, there you go. I just gotta get my bicep bigger and then, then maybe it'll be good. Oh, I got, I got the last lesson here. Or uh, let's, well, maybe it's the last lesson, I don't know, but so, something. Uh, that I think is pretty profound. Um, the biggest thing that will injure you, and this is, this is funny. This is actually gonna be funny. You're gonna like this. Uh, the biggest thing that will injure you from training is trying to be right. Right. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that, uh, you may have an idea of what is the right technique and you're ignoring signs of what the body's telling you, like you're in some sort of pain or inflammation or you're feeling just a popping, cracking feeling in a certain area that just doesn't feel quite right. And then you push through it anyway. I can't tell you how many guys over the years that I've talked to in the gym that they, they felt the sign, they kind of knew it and they said, ah, fuck it. I'm just going to go forward and just, uh, just push through. So yeah, sometimes, uh, that's the hard challenge of this path is that it's a path of, you know, fucking strong, you know, willpower moving in a certain direction. Uh, but at the same time, you have to temper that with a certain amount of intelligence, you know, a certain amount of, uh, vigilance, let's put it that way. You temper it with vigilance. And then from there, uh, then a great symbiosis, is that even a word? Uh, a symbiotic relationship can happen, right? And, uh, that, that, that's really what, uh, what I'd have to say. Uh, so, so yeah, you, you want to have that strong willpower push through, you know, go grind it out. Right. Uh, but at the same time, when it comes down to ranges of motion or certain techniques or certain exercises that are popular, uh, yeah, be careful with that. Cause what's popular is usually what's collectively stupid. That's <laughs> man. I got to put these things on t-shirts, but what's popular is usually what's collectively stupid. It's not really what's collectively right. You know, <laughs> cause if you look on social media right now, you're seeing a lot of collectively stupid. So, and I know most of you guys agree with me, but, but anyway, I'm just saying in, in fitness, it's, it's also true. Uh, you know, so, uh, people will look at what one guy did for four years and say, Oh, see, you know, he's doing everything perfect. He's okay. And I'm like, well, no, give it another 30 years. Like they'll ignore the guy that's done something for 35 years and then pay attention to the guy that's done something for five years. And they'll say, Oh, the guy that did something for five years because he's, he's younger and he's got a greater following must be right. Well, you know, that's not true. Uh, you have to do experiments over a long period of time to know the results. In some cases, long-term results are, are just as important, right? Not just uh, short-term too. So uh, some people say, oh yeah, you, you're squatting wrong or you're doing the wrong range of motion. That's going to cause injuries. I'm like, well, I've been training for 35 years. Like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that maybe I've experimented long enough to really know? I mean, I think 35 years is pretty much a good window to do an experiment. And I've been doing the experiment for 35 years. So uh, you know, uh, chances are you're wrong, you know, when you're saying what I should be doing and if I'm doing something wrong. So yeah, don't follow the collectively stupid. That's, that's my advice. <laughs>
Follow your body. Your body's your guru. All right, that's the final set. Thanks a lot, guys, for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this workout or got something out of it, even though I did have a mic malfunction at some point in the workout. And uh, yeah, and if you like this sort of stuff, I'm doing the Patreon podcast on Patreon. The link is in the description. And thanks a lot to the Patreon supporters and take care for now.